but I've never been a massive fan of having a massive, oh my God, cat. Love the cat. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to let this cat be a cat. <laughs> and just turn into a furry right there. <laughs> Fantasy Star is kind of a weird series for me where I have really enjoyed it over time. And Fantasy Star Online in particular played a really big role in, in me growing up and being introduced to online games and things like that. But despite that, I don't really feel like I have the words to express what makes Fantasy Star Online interesting as a series or what exactly drew me to Fantasy Star Online in the first place. And I think it's something I've kind of struggled with to solve for a very long time. And so today I want to talk to two YouTube content creators, if you would call it that, um, which is Deployable Lover and Section Skylight. They both make videos kind of focused around, I'd say, MMO or action RPG style content. Some of that's more retro stuff, some of that's more modern stuff. But one thing that really caught my eye about their content is that they still play Fantasy Star Online today. So the original Dreamcast game that came out in like 1990, 2000 kind of thing. Um, but they still are, are, are playing and enjoying Fantasy Star Online today. So I wanted to kind of get an idea of like what they like about the game and why they keep investing like hundreds of hours into this old online semi MMO RPG ish kind of game, even though, you know, obviously there's so many other options out there these days. But to start with, we talk about how they got into the series and also what they like about various Fantasy Star games in general, including the modern releases, um, Fantasy Star Universe, and, and everything else kind of in between. In my head, Fantasy Star Online as a video game is very big and impactful. I actually don't know how many units it sold over time mm -hmm. to say how actually big and impactful it was or if it's just the type of audience. I think playing Fantasy Star Online today feels niche. Yeah. But loving Fantasy Star Online for what it was is probably not, right? Those are I feel like those are two separate conversations yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and and so I guess maybe what the question I'm asking is when you guys are getting an audience is it the people who are engaged with the game today or are you finding that you have people show up that are just like, "Ah, man, I missed this game. I'm going to watch you." shoot things in caves for two hours and just have a good time right i think for me on, on my end at least it, it's a good mix of both okay. uh, i definitely get a lot of people that i still play with now and um, so people that have met me on the on the private servers and just hang out and play each week but there mm -hmm. is also definitely particularly in youtube videos I, I do get a lot of people leaving comments like oh i used to play this 20 years ago and i totally forgot you could still play it you know um, <laughs> so people who've obviously have memories of playing it ages ago they've then stumbled across a video so i think there is, there is a good mix of both i think does that seem yeah, to be deployable I, I yeah I, I agree i think um what i will say about the community of fantasy star is there's there are two types there's there's one type which are people that are relatively a similar age to me, I'm 30 and people that are just around that kind of age and they're just happy to see anyone play anything of that sort of time, but fantasy star mainly. Yeah. Um, they're kind of the diehard people that will follow you no matter what game you play. They'll, they're just, mm. they, they like being around like-minded people. And to them, fantasy star was much more than just a game. It was a social construct. So they kind yeah. of just build a sense of community around that game. And then you get the other half, which is just, diehard fantasy star fans and they're like i don't want anything else other than pso ngs isn't a, a fantasy star game you know oh, like yes. full on you know the conversation yeah. we're having right so um yeah it's 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 very very similar to me i think sky has definitely got a far more dedicated fantasy star fan base than i have is that fair to say mate i would say so i mean i know for my streams when i started streaming in one of my first streams i tried to play some ngs as well mm -hmm. and see that is it half the people would just leave as soon as you started playing anything yeah. other than PSO. There was a definite bias towards, I, I want you to play PSO and nothing else. <laughs> Do you think part of that might be the type of content you guys make? Because, you know, when I look at section or uh, sky skies uh sorry i'll say section skyline your name's written in front of me right now <laughs> so uh when i look at sky's content it's very like optimization driven um yeah. you do your lore videos and stuff like that and it's like almost like very um analytical in a lot of ways yeah, yeah and then like i go to deployables page and it's like you're playing a little robot named harry Botter and he's like a force <laughs> and i'm just like this looks like the worst class combination possible yeah yeah but fancy star as a series or at least the those earlier ones i think we might be able to get to that a bit later but you know lets you do stupid stuff like that right 
Mm -hmm. And 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 so in some ways, you're kind of feel like you're positioned on the complete opposite sides of what Fancy Star offers, because yeah. there is a lot of depth to the equipment stuff. I was like watching one of your videos, Sky, about like um, how like all these I forget. It's like the the genes or virus types that like affect how armor develops or something. Oh, yeah, and you can yeah. like put it in and it changes. And like, I don't remember any of that stuff being particularly useful, <laughs> but it's like there. <laughs> it's kind of neat, but you could probably make it work. So like, do you think that audience is reflected in the type of content you're creating? I guess maybe is what I'm asking there. It's for me, it's, it's difficult to say that. I mean, th there is definitely some crossover I've noticed between like, viewers that I get and viewers that deployable gets. So mm -hmm. I think some people are just there for anything fantasy star. doesn't matter if it's analytical content or if it's, you know, messing around or anything. It's, mm -hmm. I do find that people will just consume any fantasy star content they can get. Um, there are definitely some people who veer more towards one side than the other, but I, I do feel like a lot of people who turn up just want to watch the game in general. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that definitely. I think um, I think Sky definitely explores more elements of Fantasy Star than I do. I.e., different entries in the series. You tend to sort of scattergun a few of those, which I think is a really great idea. Because, yeah, yeah. for example, like uh, PSP two, like I had, I had no idea yeah. that that was a thing until you started uploading it. It just kind of like fell under the radar for me. <laughs> um, but you are right. I think there are a lot of people that are happy to consume all of fantasy star and those that are like no pso was the only game ever made ever this is <laughs> yeah. all i'm gonna play and everything yeah. else can can just be forgotten gotcha i don't want to spend too much time on like you know like a nostalgic view back on like what you guys were doing i think there's a lot of that for fantasy star online you know back when you're a kid playing i assume um but i do kind of want to know because it sounds like you guys didn't know each other back then right you didn't meet from the initial no, yeah, not time playing no, fantasy no. star so like what how did you onboard the fantasy star was were you like a fan of the previous series series or was like pso your first entry or like what was what's kind of a little bit of your history with fantasy star leading up to pso specifically well i think um not jumping the gun here but i think for me i had spent a lot of time more actually offline playing it than mm. online back in the day. So I had it on so the Dreamcast. So you started with the Dreamcast game. Okay. Yeah, the Dreamcast. Yeah. We started with version one, uh, which was, when you look back on it now, incredibly rough. <laughs> really, really <laughs> quite rough, actually. Um, <laughs> so I used to watch my dad play it. Um, we'd get a couple of VMUs each, and we'd just um, sort of rotate characters back when you had something tangible in your hand that you could put yeah. a disc in and so on and so forth. Uh, then we got online through the 56K modem, which was like... The, it's almost like if you can imagine someone constantly tugging at your Ethernet cable every single time you want to play a game, it's yeah. like that. The amount of times that my mum would be like hoovering and she'd snag the cable and I'm just like, oh, I'm just not in the game now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, yeah. So yeah, it was, basically, it was basically my dad. My dad kind of like randomly, but I don't know why he picked it up. He's, he's got no background with Fantasy Star as a series. Uh, he just picked it up. I guess he saw the artwork and was like, this is cool because I've got the exact copy behind me. But he was into um, gaming already, though. This wasn't like a gift yeah, for correct. you; it was for him. Yeah, okay. yeah. He was he was very much like one of them, one of my biggest hobbies. It might sound silly, was just watching my dad play games. Like I was just obsessed with it. Um, there was something so um, I guess relaxing about like mm -hmm. experiencing the game, but not having to have the stress of playing it. If that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and Fantasy Star just uh, just mesmerized me, especially on the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast itself, without going off on a tangent, was something that was just revolutionary for its time anyway so mm -hmm. to have this game that you could play online in a mmo format was um yeah awesome so i, di I didn't play anything about pso wise after that up until psu on the 360 i think and b before we get to you sky i i do want to ask a little bit about your dad actually tell me about your dad um <laughs> uh how old was he when this was going on oh uh, he would probably have been about I'm going to say my age now, give or take, maybe 32, give okay. or take. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was just still I, super young. I feel like Fancy Star Online, when you think about the older age of Fancy Star mm -hmm. Online, I'm thinking of like college kid kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? So someone in their 30s playing Fancy Star Online at the time, I don't know why that seems a little weird to me, but not weird. Yeah, yeah. I don't mean that. No, no, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. of course. But at the same time, also, when we're looking at like Dreamcast PS2, I mean, I think we are still looking at gaming being primarily like an older teen boy thing, right? 
um, when we yeah, look at yeah. like the general audience of games as a whole, um, at least in terms of the mainstream discussion of games, right? Because there is stuff like I, I also do content around like games for girls, and like people like to get weirded out by the fact that like Barbie games on the PC were outselling Doom and stuff like that. So there's a whole <laughs> like thing going on there with that. Yeah, yeah. But you know, when we think about the traditional market with that okay cool and like maybe one other question i asked so it sounds like you're watching your dad like what was there like a moment that you felt like i want to play pso or did it just kind of happen because oh, I was oh just yeah gonna I, pre- I tried to play pso multiple mm-hmm. times before i actually got into it but i couldn't work out how to attack pre- like and chain a combo together because i would be <laughs> spamming this button and i'm like why am i only attacking once and yeah, then I realized, to time it to actually yeah, exactly. Combo, I yeah. realized like hours and hours into the distance that like, oh, hang on, if I just hit it and then hit <laughs> it and then hit it and then it combos like that. And then, yeah, I, I was just lost in it. But I think going back to kind of why he discovered it when he was 30, I think there was a lot of promotion at the time around Sonic Adventures and mm-hmm. Fantasy Star. A lot of the artwork and advertisements were kind of like interlinked as well as Choo Choo Rocket. And that was kind of like, I think he just, fell victim to advertisement and then just oh that looks pretty i'll buy that and then i yeah, think lo and behold. version one had a sonic adventure 2 demo disc in it as well yeah yeah you, you uh, are i think yeah. you're absolutely bang on yeah i remember that actually yeah all right uh sky what how did you uh kind of get into so, it for me it was a little bit later so i started with the gamecube version of pso okay. so episode that was one my first one as well so so it, i started in about i think it was about 2003 um, mm-hmm. The way I got into it, it basically was I'd never played a fantasy star game before, but I was a huge Final Fantasy fan. And I just finished Final Fantasy VIII recently. And I had a friend call me one night and say, you've got to come around and play this game that I've got because I found something that's that's way better than any of the Final Fantasy games. You need to try it. I was like, <laughs> no, no way. I was a huge Final Fantasy fan, but I just wasn't having any of it. Went around his house and he had the GameCube version of PSO set up and they're all playing multiplayer going through Forest. Mm-hmm. And I just saw this like big chunky robot stomping through forest. Um, and I just, I just thought, right, I need to try it at least. It, it looks stupid, but I need to try it. Played it for about 10 minutes. Thought, yeah, pretty cool game. Went home on the night and just couldn't stop thinking about PSO. I got up the next morning, got a bus into the town centre, bought a GameCube and bought PSO. And then played it for thousands of hours. <laughs> <laughs> you, so in that moment, because you mentioned you're a Final Fantasy fan and he was saying it's better than Final Fantasy, right? Obviously, Final Fantasy, when it comes to mainline Final Fantasy, is very different game than what PSO yeah, is yeah. trying to do, mm-hmm. right? In your mind, did you feel like, actually, this is better than Final Fantasy? Or did that equation ever come up again in that that thought process, do you think? I think I think once PSO got its hooks in, I was like, yeah, Final Fantasy's got no chance here. <laughs> Are you still a Final Fantasy fan? Or did you, like, after um, that, do you keep playing Final Fantasy or no? To an extent, so I kept up with Final Fantasy until about Final Fantasy X or so. Um, okay. After that, I, I kind of fell out with the franchise a little bit. I just didn't really enjoy the games as much. Gotcha. I've played a little bit of fourteen. Um, I know deployables that I've tried to get me back into it, but we're so far apart in the game, it's impossible to do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I have a turbulent history with fourteen. I was a 1.0 <laughs> fan, which is like the worst thing you can be. I l- look, I love video games. 1.0 is a train wreck, but I super respect everything it tried to do because it was trying to do some weird stuff. And yeah. like, pe- that's not a good marketing move or like a good <laughs> business move. But like, you know, they're like making like the little fart. Or like, I don't need to get into this, but like the one point I'll make about this um, is like, like people complain about the auction house system not being there all the time, right? In the original game. And I get it. Like, yes, convenience is really important. But like kind of the point it seems like they're trying to do is make like little farmer markets kind of thing where you would like go and have little communities of sellers and stuff with relationships with each other. And I think that's like super cool. Did it work? No. But still, (laughs) I super appreciate it. So (laughs) so anyways, so so you got the GameCube game. You played thousands of hours at that point. And um, I mean, this is literally just kind of a word of mouth thing to you, right? It sounds like it was like you just showed up, the game was there, and it's like, this is for me now. This is now the next 10 to 15, maybe 20 years of my life. I don't know how old, how old this game is. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for me, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'd never played a fantasy star before. I had never, honestly, I'd never even heard of the franchise before PSO. Yeah. So for it to grab me as much as it did, it really, really surprised me. And it yeah. was the kind of game where I thought, right, yeah, I might play it for a few months or so and then put it down. And it's just, it's become the game I've played the most by far. Um, I can't mm. 
honestly even begin to think of how many hours I've played this game now. So, you know, you have that initial experience playing PSO um, deployable. How far did you go with PSO? Like, I, I guess the question is like for both of you guys is like, when did you guys leave PSO for the first time, if ever? So for me, I, I very much, I think because of my age at the time, I couldn't have been any older than 10, 9 mm-hmm. or 10 when I first started playing it. And because I didn't really grasp what was going on, other than the fact that this game looks kind of cool, um, I pretty much done the usual forest all the way through to ruins, uh, kind of just played, but didn't really play, if that makes mm. sense. I didn't understand the, oh, let's grind for end game gear. Let's, um, I, I mean, obviously at the time, Ultimate wasn't a thing on Dreamcast. I wasn't really playing online because mm. still, even back then, you had to be careful who you were playing with, what they were saying at that sort of age. Um, so I guess I didn't really pick it up again until after I'd, I'd experienced Fantasy Star Universe on the 360. But to actually play PSO, I truthfully, it's probably probably been Affinia, and that's only yeah. only recently. Yeah. So so in some ways, your your franchise, even though you have roots in PSO, it sounds like mm-hmm. your love for Fantasy Star probably starts with Fantasy Star Universe. Is that? A semi-accurate statement. I would say, yeah. I, I suppose growing up, the most amount of hours I spent was on the official Sega servers of PSU, mm. um, which even to this day is is the. I won't get into it, but that um, that experience is still yet to be replicated for me. Anyway, well, I don't want to. I don't want to take too much time on it, but I do think it's important to talk about. You know what PSU did for you, because I think it Mm. gives context for, you know, the conversation later. So like, you know, what do you value in the experience of PSU? Because I'll be honest with you, when it comes to PSU, and sorry, my cat's waking up and about to move around across the screen, probably. (laughs) Um, um, When I, I don't hear a lot about why people like PSU. Like, I played it briefly, but for a lot of people, I just remember that initial conversation of, it's not Fancy Star Online, and then they fell off and I never really heard mm. about why people appreciate PSU. I think much like, and again, I didn't experience the 1.0 of 14, but I feel like PSU was almost the 1.0 of Fantasy Star. Mm. It, what I mean by that is it tried a lot of new things, some of which weren't necessarily accepted that well, uh, and some of which I think were fantastic. But I think one thing it did really well and i've said this multiple times is it took the social aspect of fantasy star online and created a an open zone by zone traversal world that you could then you know rather than stand around in a lobby on a ship and just chat to these people you could sit by a waterfall you could eat some cake together you could i don't know go off and kill a dragon together then come back out and you're in the same area it was it was kind of like Oh, we can quite literally just go and explore. You know, we can listen to the the background music, and I feel like it kind of pushed a lot of its own boundaries. I just feel like there were certain areas that it didn't affect me too much at the time because I also really enjoyed the story, controversially of uh, of PSU. Um, mm-hmm. But I felt like there was a lot of areas that, unfortunately, PSU just fell short for a lot of people generalizing. I want to hone in a little bit on mm-hmm. um, the what you mentioned about you know how it kind of interconnects these places and makes like a a more community driven approach maybe kind of thing because when you think of yeah. yeah PSO when you think about it you're in a lobby you join a room there's four people in that room you go do what you're gonna do you're kicked out back to the lobby right yeah, yeah. Um, and if I remember correctly how it works in PSU is there is the main lobby mm-hmm. you go into a mission it's six people. Four to six people. I forget how many people. Yeah, it is. six. Yeah. And then when you get when you go when you finish that mission, it puts you somewhere else. It puts you in like Correct. a lobby off somewhere else that is yeah, not yeah. connected with the rest of the lobbies, and you're there with whoever ends up being mm-hmm. there. Yeah, um, yeah. And I don't know how like I don't know how far that goes, <laughs> like like how many lobbies are in a chain and how populated they are. Like, so it's almost like it's almost like if the open world was a train system. You like you're yeah. going on stops, right? To lock exactly, right? yeah, it is. Okay. And yeah, yeah, I suppose the that is the easiest way to look at it because if you look at any train map or train yeah. stop map here in the UK, at least, it does show you one after the other, and this is where you'll end up. But yeah. I think what kind of clicked in my brain about that system was 
I used to run a quest called White Beast all the time. Mm-hmm. And the first time I ever did it, when you killed the dragon, you'd be teleported to the top of the pavilion and you'd walk out and there'd be this like balcony and you could look over it. You could look at all the scenery and there's merchants and stuff there. And the the music was just this really kind of like, it's like a, I guess like a pan flute kind of like, it's really like just mm. subtle in the background, but it's very there, you know? And uh, I remember sitting around with some of my mates at the time, which some of which I still actually speak to now. And um, you just, we just, just sat there and just spoke for hours, you know? And I think <laughs> you end up making more memories. So for example, PSO, you'd make memories in the mission. You kill the enemy, you get a rare drop, you're back in. Whereas PSU, you make more memories about the destinations that you travel to, as opposed to what's going on in each mission or raid. If that makes gotcha. sense. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely. Before we move on to Sky, I, I want to know, outside of Fantasy Star, were you playing any online games like of this kind uh, of scale? I think the only, well, this is going to sound super weird. The only game that I, I dabbled in outside of PSO and PSU at the time was Lord of the Rings Online, okay. which is yeah. what I'm now playing at the same time <laughs> so it's kind of gone like full circle really um but yeah as opposed to see i i kind of i never played like ultima online diablo one i you know i knew they yeah. were there but i never really was around for that but yeah, yeah i guess psu was probably the biggest at the time sky is this true for you as well like i don't think anyone here has played like everquest or anything like that like the ultima online stuff like i think we're all i think we're all of semi the same generation of people who are playing mm-hmm. online games and in the similar spaces i think that's yeah. an important context to have probably so so okay and sky like what was your experience like you know um it sounds like you were a lot more invested in pso so i'm uh, i'm curious you know like when did you feel like you had a stopping point when you stop start stop playing pso or was it like an ongoing thing for you or so I think the, the first time I probably stopped playing is after I played GameCube PSO for quite a while. Um, I got to a point where mm-hmm. I played it online pretty much every night. And mm-hmm. it got to a point where a lot of the people I was playing with kind of moved on to other things. Mm-hmm. So I kind of lost the the will to really want to log on because as, as fun as PSO is, it's so much better with other people. Yeah. And um, particularly if you've got a group of friends that you can run with it as well. Yeah. So I, I just thought, right, maybe it's time to put PSO down for a bit. You know, Batman, I have probably spent the last few years of my life constantly in this game, so it's probably about time for a break. <laughs> um, what year was, would you say that's about? I would say maybe around, I want to say maybe 2004, 2005, maybe. Okay, so about a one to two year run you had with PSO before something like that happened. So Yeah, um, since then though, I, even after that it was still every few months I'd still get the urge to jump back in every so often. I'd play a mm-hmm. little bit more. But I didn't really get hooked again probably until whenever the official Blue Burst server was. I can't remember what year that was now. Mm-hmm. Um, once Blue Burst launched, I was, I was in in a big way again. <laughs> I always forget that like, Blue back. Burst was like its own thing sometimes. Like I, I never played on the Blue Burst servers. Um, okay. I think in my head at the time, it was kind of like, oh... You know, this is not me saying this is what I think today, but I think it was just like, oh, here's Square Sega, not Square Enix, Sega trying to prop up like this old game <laughs> yeah, and try yeah. to figure out a way to monetize this still. Um, <laughs> I don't know how successful it was or not. Obviously, there's new content and stuff. So there's reasons to play from a content perspective. There's reason to play Blue Burst as well. So so Blue Burst, I guess in, in that in that is that did you play that from start to finish? I don't remember when those servers shut down, but, you know. Yeah, so I played Sega. Blue Burst pretty much from the day it went live until pretty much the day it ended. Um, okay. Pretty consistently most of the way through. Um, a lot of the friends I had on GameCube came back for Blue Burst, so again, it made it a lot easier. But I met a lot of new people through Blue Burst as well. Um, gotcha. and yeah, they just took over my life really for a few years. <laughs> and did you just roll right into private servers once those were shut down? The uh, Blue Burst was shut down? or More or less. So uh, without going into too much, but um, there was a private server that popped up more or less as Sega servers closed. I think it had been mm-hmm. around actually while the official server was up, but if you knew, you knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I moved over to there, and then there was a, a slight issue with that server, which I won't go into too much, um, but there was a, a slight <laughs> data loss problem on the server. Yeah. Where a lot of people lost <laughs> stuff. Um, so after that, again, I, I pulled away from PSO for a bit because I just, I'd lost a lot of stuff from that. Yeah. And it was and only Bluebirds, then... you lost all your stuff too, right? Because those, those yeah. were server side <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Lo- yeah. Lost a level 200 on the, on the Sega server. So that hurt. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's been through a lot of Sky. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the bigger question for you is what is the longest gap of time you haven't been playing Fantasy Star Online? 
<laughs> have you ever pro- gone a year without logging into PSO? <laughs> I think possibly. I think I'm just trying to know. I think maybe probably when I was at university. So that will have been about okay. yeah. probably around 20, yeah, I think about 2007 to 2010, maybe towards the end of uni, there was maybe, I want to say maybe two, three years where I probably didn't touch PSO at all. Gotcha, um, gotcha. I did jump into some other games. Like I know I played the original Guild Wars a little bit. I played okay. Diablo 2. Um, I did play FF14 1.0 as well, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you play the Fantasy Star games? Because I would think being a big PSO fan, did like Universe appeal to you and stuff like that? Were you on that train the whole way through or did you just kind of hold off? So with Universe, I, I did play it a fair bit, but definitely nowhere near as much as PSO. I felt that for me, because I was such a big PSO fan, there were certain things that PSU did that I didn't really enjoy as much. So yeah. for me, um, one of the big things with PSO was getting together with your friends and going hunting for rares. It was mm-hmm. just a collective thing you could do. It was basically the reason you would log on PSO to go and hunt stuff. Um, yep. In PSU, I kind of felt the direction I took with it was not particularly what I enjoyed. I didn't really like the synthesizing in PSU and making things and yeah, like watching a everything fail. Instead. Yeah. yeah. So for me, as, as much as I enjoyed PSU, it just it didn't feel the same to me. So I, I didn't put as much time into the game for sure. Gotcha. I did still enjoy it, though. I played on the um, PC servers, though. I know you I know on your channel you've done a lot of stuff with the most recent Fancy Star online. Um, were there any other Fancy Star games that kind of resonated with you more that kind of brought you to playing New Genesis, I think is what it's called? So I think the only other Fantasy Star game that I, I've really, really enjoyed a lot is um Fantasy Star Portable 2 Infinity. Okay. Which was it was only released in Japan. So I had to play a Japanese version. Didn't understand any of the story at the time because it was all in Japanese. <laughs> but just the way that game was structured, it it felt like it was almost like an homage to PSO, honestly. It did a lot of things very similar, but it still had a lot of the, the best bits of PSU as well. Mm. So because of that, it kind of felt like um, almost like a greatest hits to an extent. So I, I did genuinely really, really enjoy my time with, with Infinity. What elements of PSO do you think they kind of brought in with that? For me, it's mainly, honestly, like the, the rare hunting. So they they made it a big focus of Infinity, for particularly for the later game. There was gotcha. a lot of focus on you know, trying to grind for the best gear, trying to get all the, the really insane rare drops, which I think captured a lot of what PSO was about at the time. Yeah. For the most recent Fantasy Star, I assume, did you play PSO 2 when that came out? It was like 2010 or something like that, or sometime in that like... 2010 to 2014 range i think is when pso2 came out did you play that at all or yeah so i played i played pso2 uh, japanese version from actually from the second alpha test which i think was 2011 um, okay. and the game launched in 2012 but i played that for i want to say about it would have been about seven years i think on and off but again pso2 for me is just such a radically different game from the earlier games and as much as i respect mm a lot of the things it did it just feels like such a big departure for me so i just never could never get as invested in it i think the only reason i really stuck with it so long is because i had a a long-time friend from pso who sort of followed me through the games and i basically just logged on just to chill out with him really from an outside perspective when you look at pso2 you could probably also look at like pso2 new genesis and think it is just kind of more of that but it seems on your channel it's pretty clear you have an investment in new genesis what would you say is like the difference between those two games? Um, and am I accurate in my read that it sounds like you might prefer New Genesis over what base PSO2 was doing? I think for me, I personally prefer New Genesis just because it feels like something a little bit different from even from PSO2. I think because I did play Japanese PSO2 over such a long time, I was just mm-hmm. kind of bored of it really and just a bit burnt out with it which is weird when i played pso for like 20 years and i'm not bored of that so i don't know how that works well it sounds like with pso2 it might have been more of a friend commitment kind of thing where there's value in that right but at the same time like i go through this with some of my friends where like i'll play a game to play with them not because i necessarily want to play this video game (laughs) yeah yeah. i'm gonna get something out of the game it's cool um but i'm there for them more and 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 like live service games are scary because then people are like you want to play this game with me for years and i'm like no (laughs) (laughs) sorry i will play a rpg with you that has an ending thank you (laughs) so so i think one thing i liked about new genesis is that 
first of all, it look, just visually, it looks amazing. It was mm-hmm. a big, big departure from PSO2. PSO2, particularly on the global version, I don't know why, but for some reason, it just graphically just doesn't look good. It, it actually looks different from the Japanese version, which I don't really understand why. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's something they've done with the game, but it just doesn't look as good. But the the main thing I like about New Genesis, honestly, is just the fact that it's really approachable. It's a game mm-hmm. that you don't have to put a lot of commitment into. So you can literally just log on for 15, 20 minutes a day if you want to, do your daily tasks, log off, and you'll get decent stuff from doing that. It's a game mm-hmm. you can play very casually if you want to. Whereas I feel like PSO2 was, it was almost information overload to an extent. You would log on and you, you would just have tons of pop-ups with loads of different systems. Mm-hmm. There'd be like three or four different ways of doing the same thing. And it just it was just massively overcomplicated by the end. And I feel that New Genesis has kind of refreshed that. There are definite faults with New Genesis, though. I'm not going to defend it entirely because I appreciate it's a very, very divisive game. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of, if you want to like, if the person listening wants to hear about this stuff, you have a lot of videos on your channel that kind of talk yeah. about new Genesis and kind of the breakdown. So I think for me, what's more important is like what you appreciate about it, because I mostly hear negative things about new Genesis. Um, I don't know how true those, like I'm very skeptical of people's feelings on things. And usually if I feel like it hasn't been explained very well, either I'm like, okay, what are we angry about here? <laughs> a lot of times. Um, Cause sometimes it's like the things people are angry about seem silly. Um, that's myself included. Um, so like, it's not, it's not that I don't like think people are wrong about how they feel about it, but sometimes I wonder exactly why they feel the way they feel with it. And like how much of it is just like a personal preference thing versus the game. Um, you know, it's hard, like life service games are so huge these days. And some of them yeah, are yeah. so old that like, how do you compete with a game that's been running for 10 plus years? Right. Yeah. Like I imagine in some ways, New Genesis probably feels really empty compared to base PSO2 just because of the different content. Like, well, I mean, I, I know technically can switch between the two, but they're kind of separate entities, I think. So within the launcher. It, it's, so. it's really interesting with um, with New Genesis because when it launched, obviously the Japanese version had been out for eight years for base PSO2. And when mm-hmm. NGS launched, I think the initial comparison was comparing it to eight years worth of content on the Japanese side mm-hmm. PSO2. So I yeah. think that's where a lot of the negativity does come from. So I do feel some of the negativity is warranted, but there is definitely a lot of overblown things about yeah. it as well. Um, deploy by, I, I don't know if you've played any of these games. Do you have any specific thoughts about these titles or? I've uh, so I've played well more more recently. I've spent time playing NGS. I've probably put, okay. I'd say up to I'd say ten to fifteen hours solidly into ngs which isn't a great deal but it's very fresh and very recent but much like sky i didn't play pso2 as early on the jp servers but my experience with pso2 was through the pso2 tweaker the japanese download and i spent about a year or so playing that so it wasn't to the extent that sky has has played it but i'm i kind of my feelings are almost virtually the same it's just that one of the main reasons I didn't rush to pick up PSO2 on the global release is just because it's more of the same thing. I'm not going to move out of a two bedroom house to go and move into another two bedroom house. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Like it's the same thing. Um, they weren't reinventing the wheel here. It was just something that we should have had eight years earlier that we've now got eight years later. It just doesn't make any sense. And we're going to um, put up a VPN requirement to block you from getting into yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm not denying, I'm not denying that it's great. It's great for the game. It's great for Sega that they've brought it to all these different platforms now, which is fantastic. Um, but I think you're dealing with PSO2 being, like we said before, it's a, it's a vast departure from PSU, let alone what it is from PSO. So, yeah. It's kind of, you've got, I, I find in a way, sometimes Fantasy Star as a franchise has almost shot itself in the foot a little bit because as much as they try to innovate and change things, every single entry is totally different. And we're not even talking about episode three at this point. So <laughs> everything is vastly, vastly different. Um, the but my- PSO2 episode three or PSO no, episode no, three? PSO episode three, the card okay, game. The card game on GameCube, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but t- talking about NGS, my thoughts are pretty much the same as yours ben i um i don't like to make assumptions on something until i've tried it myself so Mm. i wanted to try ngs mainly because uh sky's always kind of sung its praises anyway and um 
I've I've kind of got this. My aesthetic isn't hyper anime. It never has been. I've never enjoyed that kind yeah. of. As much as I can appreciate a good anime, it's never been my go-to. So to kind of enter the game and instantly, I guess you're kind of on the back foot a little bit because you think, "Wow, everything just looks like crazy anime here." Yeah. Um, so that was I kind of got around that a little bit. And do you know what? Like as you as you're playing, yes, there are like obvious differences. Um, you know, like for example, the one thing that hit me like a ton of bricks was you're limited to the set of photon arts that you've got on each weapon. You yeah. Know, there is, there's mm-hmm. no other than perhaps, I guess they evolve and change a little bit over time, but other than what you've got, that's, that's all you're stuck and with. Photon arts are like special moves that get attached to weapons. If it's Correct. like the PSU system, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, but do you know what, other than that, one thing I will say for NGS, for anyone that's on the fence as to whether to play it, if you play PSO2 classic and you're confused about the story, then play NGS because it's a lot more linear. It's a lot more, it's a lot easier to understand. Whereas, I mean, Sky, you'll know more about this, but I'm fairly sure for each episode of PSO2, there was a different writer or different developer for it. Is that right? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, there was the, like the head of, um, I think it was the producer or the developer, I can't remember which now, um, but they basically changed it for every single episode of PSO2 base. So it just felt like a completely different game every episode. It does. It's, it's like, yeah. it's absolute carnage. I feel like from one moment you're going from one, th- bearing in mind you're already fighting the menus as it is anyway. And I'm yeah. not trying to make this whole thing about PSO2. But yeah, you, you, when, if you're dealing with the systems, you're dealing with a really disconnected story or what feels like a disconnected story, um, then a complete different gameplay change. I think NGS. They took everything that everyone was already doing from PSO2 or had issues with in PSO2 and just made it far more linear. Like in PSO2 Classic, everyone was using photon arts to get around the map faster. So they just thought, well, why don't we let people sprint and jump and slide and drift, you know? Yeah, yeah. I guess people are going to do it anyway, so we may as well just put it in the the game, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And like the story, you know, okay, the story, depending on how you follow it, can be a little bit convoluted, but at least everything is in kind of like one place you get you follow the orange icon the orange icon says talk to this person and it's done like like, it's as easy as that so yeah i guess that's my my thoughts i I really didn't mind ngs at all to be fair gotcha um so for you deployable i mean it sounds like with you sky you've kind of been related with pso pretty much this entire time so so this question might not apply to you as much although if there's (laughs) any thoughts on it let me know but like for deployable what you know, as you're going through all these other online games over the years and things like that and playing PSU and things like that, what brought you back to PSO specifically? I I don't, I guess I don't want to sound like a, a broken record, but I think nostalgia is the obvious elephant in the room here. I feel mm. like a lot of people have gone, I don't quite feel as young as I did 15 years ago, so I'm going to go and play something that makes me feel young again. Um, so there was there was that element, but uh, to me, that one of the there's two major things that led me back to it. One was the artwork, which is the artwork for the Dreamcast. Still to this day, it, like I said, it's in this room, and I look at it every single day that I'm in here because even to now, I really do feel like the artwork for that game holds up over and above a lot of titles that are even put out now. That's providing yeah. titles that you can even get tangible artwork for because everything's digital these days. Yeah. Um, and secondarily was the soundtrack, the soundtrack, the the menu music, the zone by zone, the the town, the city. When you're on, you know, Pioneer or down in Ragot, everything was just perfection. So to me, mm. the game could have been bloody terrible, but outside of that, that's what constantly. And it, it's surprising how powerful a sound can be in your brain. I mean, one thing I have noticed in like uh, in watching your stuff specifically is that like in the middle of doing something, you'll just be like, "Hey, look at this skybox," and just like you're yeah, like yeah. look at yeah, this, yeah. just like the clouds, <laughs> and then like make like, like you're playing in caves, like man, I like the music here, and it seems like those are like little touches you do appreciate, right? Definitely, um, it is almost like I don't know, I. I don't know if I've communicated this to you and it's not necessarily a problem that you bring it up, but like the, the word nostalgia is something I, I like to generally avoid mm-hmm. because I think it kind of says um, to me, it can be used as, 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 as negative from the person who's saying it as well sure, as the yeah. person who's, who's like saying that, you know, something is nostalgia that it says there is no, 
there's no logic to why I like something other than when I was younger, this is what I enjoyed, which I don't necessarily agree with that. But I think yeah. the experiences you had growing up will inform the things you enjoy. I just don't think, and I think nostalgia as a word does kind of make that connection, but I think there's a little bit more you can dig into that. And more like, sort I, of it, in my head, I was stuff, thinking of yeah. like a piece of meat that you're like cutting into with knives. I don't know why that was like what I was thinking about and started doing hand motions with that. But, um, but anyways, not to get too far into that part um, specifically, but you know, it does seem like you, you take these moments, you're like, oh, look at these little attention to detail and things like that. And I mean, like part of this might come from you with like PSU where you're like sitting in these lobbies, you know, and you're talking with people and like, you know, PSU is a very different time in terms of where social media was and the ability to multitask when playing games and stuff like that. I don't really know PSU's particular case, but I know it's like when I played Final Fantasy XI, that game forced you to play full screen and you didn't really have like a cell phone on the side to, you know, just futz around while you're doing something, right? So it's just like you are there in that game playing that game with people. And so like I think those little interactions you have in PSU, I could definitely see something like that informing kind of like how you you interpret the world of PSO and how you consume those things. Right. And it is like, Hey, here's this little ice patch that like has a unique graphic for some re reason. And it's just there. And you're like, yeah, look at that ice patch. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I appreciate that you do that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah. I think, um, I think with those games, as much as it might just slip under the radar, but mm -hmm. PSO especially, has such an amazing color palette for its time. It's got, you think of all the techniques, each technique, and it's not done by mistake. Each of them have got such vivid colors that they just ingrain themselves in your mm -hmm. brain over time. And those things that are there for a reason, there's a reason why rare drops are like bright red boxes because you're going to remember this stuff. And, you know, at Sky spoke about it multiple times, but you go into forest, caves, mines, ruins, that in, in each one of those platforms in each one of those zones there is a standout room typically yeah that is put there for you to to remember and appreciate and take in and um i've always appreciated the i guess the aesthetic of things over and yeah. above sometimes the gameplay because even um I, I guess a lot of it probably stems from how you play the games uh, at the time i was always a fan of obviously the dreamcast and that was quite a quirky little system in itself mm -hmm. whereas yeah, i think yeah. as much as the magic of PSO is still available in Affinia format and private servers. Sometimes sitting here, because I never played the Blue Burst version on PC, um, on the official servers, I should say. So sitting here with a keyboard and mouse and a controller at my computer, downloading a digital game of a game that I used to play on disc with a visual memory unit seems very weird. So I think I'm more connected to that than I am sometimes the gameplay experience, although the gameplay experience is fantastic. Yeah, I mean... One of the uh, nice, the beauty maybe of, of online games and stuff like this, where you have these long term relationships with them that you appreciate with other people is that they are these very, they absorb more of your life than normal things, right? Not, this isn't like exclusive to it. Like, you know, I, I'm a part of like the Xeno community to some extent for Xenoblade and stuff like that. And part of, you know, what makes that that series so impactful to people are the people who surround that series and discuss it and theorize about where the story's going and things like that. Right. And there's like a community of people you can kind of engage with it and enjoy it with. And I think a lot of times with like fancy star online, you know, these things start to have a much bigger impact on our lives because other people are there to appreciate it with you in some ways. Um, and then, so, you know, that, I think that kind of bleeds into like, well, I have this physical disc that connects me to that, right? There's this thing that I have in my house that I, you know, own that connects me to it. And like, I'm kind of in the weird mindset that like, I kind of don't care about physical, but I realize physical is very important to emotional feelings about certain things. And so, yeah. for, but, but for me, it's more about how does this connect you to this whole experience um, rather than I own thing congratulations i'm i own thing hello welcome show <laughs> you kind of thing right um it's kind of a weird thing with like the retro game community when like somebody's like i have expensive thing but it doesn't like connect them to anything per se it's just they have the expensive thing and it's like cool guy <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah like uh and i shouldn't say that that connects them to collecting there's a community with that i take back what i said anyways uh but you know i think that is a part of it is is you know that i'm rambling 
but I think, you know, it becomes a greater experience than just the game you're playing. I think is the point I'm trying to make with that. So, um, so for you, Sky, I know you do like a lot of like lore videos and stuff. Does that kind of like, is that more of, I don't know, like, do you appreciate the lore for what it is? Or do is that more of like just a breaking down the game for people on YouTube and stuff that are curious about it? Like, how do you, what is your relationship with the world of Fantasy Star Online? So for me, honestly, it, it's mainly just because I, I genuinely do enjoy the story of PSO myself as well. Okay. Um, on, to be brutally honest, a lot of the content that I do on YouTube, I just do because I enjoy doing it. If people yeah. watch it, that's, that's great. But I do it primarily <laughs> because I enjoy doing it. First yeah. and foremost, um, none the, of us the... are uh, making raking money in on it. No, this, no, so. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, I've always, I've always really, really enjoyed the story. I, I like how it has some ties to the original games. I like how there's, I like how the story is delivered in PSO. So how it's not just explicitly told to you. You mm-hmm. have to go and seek it out. You have know, to find all the messages from Rico, try and piece together what's going on. The same mm-hmm. for episode two as well. I've always really, really enjoyed how that's delivered, even through things like item descriptions where it'll give you little bits of information in the items sometimes as well. I just mm. really, really like how it encourages you to kind of seek out and and figure things out for yourself. So yeah, th- that, that's the main reason I'm doing a lot of videos just because I, I do genuinely really like yeah. the story for PSO. In some ways, it's like semi-environmental storytelling, but it's more it's not really environmental. It's, it's there, it's in text, but yeah. it's just kind of like tucked away in like little text pods and things like that that you could completely ignore and not engage with at all if you didn't want to (laughs) so i literally this last time i played pso i actually sat down and thought about like where are you going in pso and i was like i think you're just going down like you go in this building and you just go down i've never thought about it that way so it's just this very strange thing like i don't think i ever realized like what you were doing in pso when i was a kid of just (laughs) hey here's a ruins this is a spaceship at the bottom down here technically i didn't think about that ever (laughs) so (laughs) so but i was a very like when i was a kid i did not really consume world and story very well so so it's not too surprising with that so um so you're playing you know these more modern games off and on here and you know each of those it sounds like you guys have connections with and you probably have like communities that you engage within those um for pso today when you're playing pso today obviously you guys are content creators um, and you do have a variety of content, but PSO, at least to me from the outside, seems to be kind of your main push right now with the original PSO. Um, how much of your experience with playing PSO in the modern day do you think relates to the online service with the community there that you're like engaging with people who are just playing PSO? And how much of that do you think relates to your channel and you building a community around there around it or you know if it can be interconnected as well i'm just kind of curious you know do do you feel like the experience of pso you have today is defined by the community that's there or defined by you creating content and creating a community in your own space i think for me personally just because i i'd started revisiting affinia pso before i really even had the channel in fact i've got a super super old video that i Mm -hmm. managed to I guess, come up with enough courage to make at the time after I've been playing it for a little while. And just to um, clarify, like, if any is like the current main private server, I guess right? it's now the closest version to yeah. vanilla blue burst that you can, you can okay. really get. Um, and that was, that was, I'm talking sort of four years ago, but at the time I was definitely playing just for the community experience mm-hmm. and the people, I guess. I mean, obviously my situation right now is a little bit different because I'm having a few little technical issues with PSO, which means I'm not playing Affinia right now. Mm -hmm. But it does definitely, and I guess it doesn't sound shallow to say this, but I think PSO, as it is the the preferable medium out of the fantasy style franchise that people enjoy, and I enjoy playing it, I definitely think that becomes more of a focus on, okay, this is my channel. These are the videos I'm putting out. If I'm going to play PSO, it's probably going to be to record something or because mm-hmm. I'm streaming it. That's where I would be at right now. Gotcha. Yeah, so for me, it's maybe a little bit different. So initially, I would say that the, the purpose of the channel was just to engage with the community of PSO because mm-hmm. I think even now there is still a very active community on servers like Affinia and there is other private servers as well. So it was to kind of... I guess kind of showcase that the game is still active. There is still like a thriving community for it. 
mm-hmm. over time though i i have kind of built up a, a community of of like regulars who do watch the content because of my channel i guess mm-hmm. so it, it's now it's kind of pivoted a little bit now to to where i feel that some people now watch the content more not so much for the game itself but just because that they, they want to hang out in game you know they yeah. want to hang out hang out with the the streamers or I think now it is it is more about just hanging out and and creating a new community rather than relying on how the game has been previously in the past. Yeah, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> when you say previously been in the past, you mean like how the social aspect of it has been? Because like when I think about when I played PSO as a kid, you know there weren't many other avenues to contact the people I was playing PSO with. If I want to talk to somebody on PSO, I logged into PSO to play and talk with them. Right. And that was my one relationship with that person. Unless I really went out of my way to be like, Hey, do you want to talk on whatever chat service? Cause I did use like MSN. There's like AOL chat back then. Right. But most people in PSO, I talked to in PSO and never anywhere else kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I imagine that experience doesn't really exist today as much. I'd imagine there's Discord servers, even for like yeah, Athena, log into there and stuff. So you have like this separate connection to people. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's, it's almost like bringing PSO into the modern day. So now you have mm-hmm. these other avenues to communicate with people outside the game. So you can do things like, you know, you can now set meetups outside the game. You can arrange mm-hmm. to meet people to go and hunt things now instead of having to just log on PSO and see who's online. Yeah. So it, it's almost like PS was kind of caught up to the modern day because of, you know, things like Discord. So mm-hmm. it, it's nice to see, honestly, because it does make it a lot easier to, you know, to get along with the community. Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself when, like with Discord, there's voice chat functionality and stuff like that. Do you find, you know, people getting in voice chats together when they're playing and stuff like that, rather than using the end game text chat kind of thing? Um, on my end, at least, it, it's still honestly mainly the in game voice, uh, the in game text chat. Mm-hmm. I do. So I I have my own Discord channel where people do use voice chat a little bit on there. But honestly, when I play PSO, even on the streams, most people will just jump into the chat or jump into PSO chat. So mm. it, that kind of feels quite nostalgic, actually, as well. <laughs> I think that's why a lot of people do it as well. I yeah, think yeah. even if even though Discord is so accessible, I think because although it's a little bit janky now, mm-hmm. but I feel like the the text chat and the little sort of quick time chats that PSO had, I think they're so funny and so easy to use that people just think oh i'm just going to stick with this medium because it's funny to respond to someone's previous message in a way that just logically doesn't make sense <laughs> and i think that's why people use it all the time because i guess there is a you know a kind of a, a throwback to oh that's how we used to do it and there are far easier mediums of course with discord but mm-hmm. i guess from a streaming perspective and my streams nowhere near as, as big as what sky is doing right now but when you're trying to then manage a voice chat call text chat on the screen stream chat it's just yeah. impossible like it's it's a nightmare so when playing pso i mean and you could talk to this about like because you guys have kind of a different relationship as youtubers to some extent it sounds like um when people are engaging with pso from what you see you know I would say a big part of PSO for me was meeting a lot of new people online. But a lot of what I feel like when I play online games today, and this might not even be a thing about how online games are, it could just be me as an adult, how I interact with people is different. Um, It is very private discussion usually like people don't feel like they are emoting outward as much kind of thing and so you can get into situations where you're playing a game and nobody's talking and yeah. like it's just like it's kind of my problem with Office 14 to some extent but it's part of it's my own problem where I don't I think I was not communicating well enough in that situation or putting myself out in situations where I was like you know talking out loud but um you know do you think a game like Fantasy Star Online still offers that kind of almost chat room like experience i think i've called it before where it's like you suddenly get added to a little chat room and you're just with a few other people and this is just now the group you're talking with whether you know them or not kind of thing does pso still allow for something like that do you feel like or i I definitely think so i feel like in the before i even knew sky or any of the the people that i play with now i feel like quite often you'd you'd, uh, jump into a game you'd get the little like kind of like emoticon like hello that would like pop up that they'd sort of put in (laughs) And then that just that either leads to a, a fluent conversation from there, or it's very much a like we're here for one reason, and that's to run TTF twenty times back to back. Like that, that's it. You kind of know exactly where you are. But um, I definitely feel like 
because it is more enclosed, and you, you spoke about 14 for a second, I, I won't take a massive tangent here. Yeah. Final Fantasy 14 is probably the least social experience I've had out of any MMO I've ever played, in yeah. the sense that you do have to be the one that puts yourself out there. I get that fully. Never been a fan of like having this massive world full of people that don't interact with each other. So PSO does that really well, just in a smaller scale. It is one of the most isolating experiences I've had playing an online game before. However, I think a lot of it has to do with my interaction with that game and the fact that it does not ask you to engage with other people very often. Um, And I think part of this is because of my age and stuff like that as well. Like when I was playing PSO, I was not forced to talk to people. I could have played completely on my own. And that game's pretty good at like letting you just play on your own if you want to. But like playing Final Fantasy 11, which is very community driven, party driven thing where you have to get with like six people. It forces you to interact with people. Like if you're going to play this game, you are going to do this. And for me, I think as I, I've gotten older and you know, maybe partly back when I was playing Final Fantasy 11 as well, it's been harder for me to kind of break the ice at times. Um, mm-hmm. And Final Fantasy 11 forces me to break the ice where I think Final Fantasy 14 does not force you. And so it lets me function without breaking the ice, which means that it becomes really isolating, I think, for me. Yeah. So Final Fantasy 14, to me, one of the main reasons I stopped playing alongside others is that game is a catalyst for drama. And it's all people want to do. That's all people want to focus about. There's, there's no... Um, you know, if you look at if you typed in Final Fantasy fourteen on YouTube, the first thing that come up is massive drama, healer drama, healers mm. on strike, healer this, and uh, there's no. Um, I guess a lot of people don't want to interact because if they if you go onto Twitter, which is a cesspool, by the way, don't go on Twitter, please don't do that. I love if Twitter, you go, but yeah, it's not cesspool. It's horrendous. <laughs> if you go onto Twitter at any point, there's a screenshot of like, oh, someone decided to say something, and then all of a sudden they're getting trolled and memed on. And I feel like the times where people do communicate, sometimes it's met with a negative reaction. So as much as that shouldn't stop you from appealing to the 99%, which are fantastic there's that element of, oh, okay, am I going to be shut down? Whereas I, I just, I don't ever remember in PSO for the limited times I went online on the Dreamcast. I don't ever remember how many, there were people, but I don't remember how many people I ran into where a social experience felt awful or felt forced or felt like I didn't want to do something. Whereas 14 is very much like, I, I don't want to be a part of this at all. Like I enjoy the game. I enjoy the platform, the metric and everything around it, the story. But as far as I'm concerned, I'd be happy if it was a, solo rpg that's where i would be out of it i think pso is an interesting one because i guess because in pso you only have the option really of public chat i know in blue burst they added like team chat you can use as well but because you can generally only use public what's chat, a team chat i don't i don't so, play blue burst so i don't so in blue burst basically it's like um you can set clans up essentially so mm, okay. it's just you set a team up of players and you can have a, a chat that you use between all the players in that team so anywhere on the server, you can talk with other people yeah, yeah. at the same time. Yeah, okay. So outside of that, you're, you've only got the typical public chat. I think because of that, I think people were a lot more careful about what they would actually say in-game. Mm-hmm. It, it seemed like there was there was like a reluctance to say anything that could be misconstrued or anything because you only had that public chat available. You, you couldn't sort of hide in party chats and you know say mm-hmm. what you wanted about people. It was It was very limited to what you could say. The one thing I will say though about PSO, um, for anyone who was around back when you know around sort of GameCube era at least anyway, is that while the in-game experience was largely very very positive, there was a lot of negativity on forums and things like that at the time. So you tend to find that a lot of the the drama that was involved with PSO would would stick to the forums instead. Yeah, mm. it, it never really seemed to sort of instigate into the game too much. But you, you'd go on some of the PSO forums back in the day, and it'd be horrendous. <laughs> Part of it, I think, to some extent, you know, I I don't want to get too much into this because this is a greater conversation about <laughs> people on the <laughs> internet and uh, content creation and what people click on and all that stuff, right? When we start talking about YouTube and things like that. But, you know, the people who tend to get most invested in something are going to have the strongest opinions, right? Yeah. And if you're logging into a forum after playing PSO to talk about PSO, you're probably 
more invested than the person logging in. You're ready for war at that point. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if you're going to edit together videos on YouTube about Final Fantasy 14, you probably are more invested than somebody who's just playing Final Fantasy 14, right? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times it's really easy to take that top. I think you even said to play like top 1% or whatever so like that and just read that as like what the community is mm-hmm. um, when it's probably probably not that mostly (laughs) and like yeah it's really easy and i do this all the time don't get me wrong like i get flustered by people all the time like why are people so like so caught up on this one thing and it's like what really is happening is there's a sub segment of people who are visible to me that i see doing this and then the rest of the people doing playing the game do not care (laughs) so um so that's part of it as well with that but yeah i think it's interesting that you know i i think also you know when we're playing pso and maybe this will like segue a little bit into my next question. But, um, you know, when we're playing PSO with people, we're probably today we're playing. I'm not even playing it. Um, we're probably playing with people who are older, right? Our age range, you know, we're kids when we're playing PSO or in that college range. So we're talking about maybe like 30 to 40. And hopefully, you know, people today are a little bit more mentally well and sound and socially well adapted. So I think. I think with a lot of these older MMOs and things like that, it often can be a little bit more cordial because people have had times to grow up and they're not just yeah. like, you know, moody teens. Um, but in asking about that, um, I am curious, you know, when you guys play PSO, do you find either younger people who weren't, you know, playing PS or weren't alive or weren't capable of playing PSO um, when it was kind of out and, and, and relevant? Um, or do you just in general find people who are playing PSO for the first time and they're saying, Hey, I, I want to check this out. What's, what's going on here? Like what, what is your experience with new players who doesn't ha- doesn't have the history with the, with the game? Um, so for me on my end, at least the, the thing I noticed quite a lot is I initially started with mainly doing NGS content mm-hmm. and I realized, I think there was a video I did where I was comparing like the rare drops in NGS to rare drops in PSO and basically mm-hmm. telling people that NGS really isn't that bad. Yeah. Um, and I realized a lot from, particularly from the comments on that video, that there was a lot of people who just didn't have a clue about PSO. And it kind of dawned on me that, okay, PSO is 20 years old. A lot of people who play NGS probably have never played it. Yeah. Because it's sold now. And I've noticed now that I do get quite a lot of people who have maybe tried PSO 2 or one of the later games like NGS and are now wanting to go back and check out PSO for the first time. Because they've, you know, that maybe they've seen a video, not necessarily mine, could be deployables or anyone else's, and they've mm-hmm. seen a video and thought, "Oh, this looks cool. I should probably go and check this out and just just see what it's all about and see where the series came from." So I do find that that's one of the main things with people who play the newer games. They they tend to just want to go back and check more out of curiosity, I think, just to see where the series came from initially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll be. Um, I guess my thoughts just echo what Sky said. But the only thing I would add to it is you get a lot of demographic our age that don't realize that PSO is still playable on a private server. Yeah, That's mm-hmm. a big thing. And you get people that are like, wait, how are you still playing this game? Like, where, where can I play this? Like, I thought mm-hmm. the Sega server shut down ages ago. So um, I, I guess unless you're looking at YouTube metrics, you can't often tell age range, who's watching, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of people, I guess that you can sort of glaze over and, and have a look at... Like, the mannerisms and sort of how old they might be, I guess, yeah, it is people roughly our age that either just don't know that the private servers are a thing or they do know and they're now just picking it up for the first time again and they're like, they've got questions about this, that and the other. So in your case, Deployable, you're not really finding people who are coming in that just don't know anything. Not that they don't know anything about PSO, they're obviously here for a reason, <laughs> but, you know, they didn't have the experience already of playing yeah, PSO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I find that, I don't know whether um, I don't I don't know if these people are typically tr- just trying to interact with the streams or the videos to sort of ask questions because I I always say to everyone if you've got a question that I can answer I will mm-hmm. absolutely you know help out but I feel like as much as I would love to see the younger generation pick up this game and go from NGS to PSO. I feel like it's just such an unlikely transition, you know, and in, in many ways, if they were, if someone messaged me and said, hi, I'm, I don't know, this person and I, I've, I'm just 20 and I've just picked up PSO. I'd be thinking, 
where have you been and what on earth are you doing at this, you know, that sort of thing. It'd be awesome to see, but yeah, I think the transition is mainly between people our age. What do you think is um, the barriers between somebody new starting and PSO? Like what, what is the, the, oh. the things that modern games offer that PSO doesn't offer? Um, straight up convenience over time. hundred mm-hmm. percent. If you said to someone, and I'm going to use the SJS here as as a really really sword dagger in the heart. You look uh, at Sky, Steel who's, J sword is that what yeah. that is? Okay, yes. and that's like yeah, a really. I remember doing runs for that and being like, this feels hopeless. <laughs> it wasn't even for me; it was for somebody else. <laughs> and um, I don't remember if they ever got it, but I do remember oh, getting yes. recruited many this times. This is to exactly go Sky is probably it. about to say what I was yeah. about to say, so I'll, I'll use Sky here as a reference. Just explain yes. how long you've hunted this this weapon for. Yeah, yeah. So I started hunting SGS on GameCube pretty much as soon as I got to Ultimate, and hunted mm-hmm. it on and off for about four years. I never found it. <laughs> Whereas you take that into account, you take I don't know what do, what do people play these days? Maybe they'll play. Uh, I guess battle royales are still popular or even uh, modern MMOs like I don't know World of Warcraft and stuff like that. Yeah. I firmly believe I'm not in the know, but if you wanted to make a World of Warcraft account, you could potentially purchase a boost from day one. You could probably get end game gear by the end of the week, maybe two weeks, mm. and then you're in. You can pay for convenience, whereas I think PSO at the time, it was very much this this game is not developed to respect your time at all. Like you have to you're signing a legally binding digital contract to say whatever you do from here on for the next 15 years of your life it may well be a waste of time but you're going to enjoy it regardless you know whereas i think games these days because they're so accessible because everything is laid out in front of you and everything's so glamorous and clickable these days i feel like yes the graphics are obviously going to be a a big demeanor here because it's to me it's a pretty game i enjoy the artwork but to others, they're going to look at it and go, why has that block man got a block shadow? And why is he shooting blocks at other blocks? You know, like, I guess that's, that can, you know, I think that's graphics the demographic. Are, I think people our age, at least, like graphics are maybe a little too emphasized. Um, mm-hmm. I think yeah, I graphics agree. were a really important part of our growing up of games where you know, everything's kind of pushing the limit. But when I look at games today, the games that are successful do not look great. Um, I don't think people think about it that much. I think as long as aesthetically you build a solid world, right? Um, I think there are issues with PSO aesthetically, but generally it's pretty solid visually. I think it depends so. on how far you go back, though. If you're talking about a game that's 20 years old, I think, for example, might be a, a really poor example, but if you were to say to someone, okay, I'm going to introduce you to Street Fighter. This is the original Street Fighter. And then I'm going to introduce the same person to, I don't know, Street Fighter 7, for example. I think they would look at that because of the visual overhaul and instantly be more appealed to that. I think it would be hard to sell someone who's playing a modern title now the visual aspect of what PSO or Blue Burst is. Because I think to us, I think progressively as we've got older, things have only got better. But for the younger generation who are coming into these games now, they're at a plateau where graphics are probably going to get as good as they're ever going to get mm. in probably my lifetime anyway, unless it goes hyper-realistic. So I guess that would probably be, in my opinion, a harder sell to that demographic than it would be to us right now gotcha. if we hadn't have played it. I think the the main sort of limiting factor for PSO for me, if you're a new player coming in, is just the complete and utter lack of tutorialization. There is a mm. very, very limited amount of it in one of the quests where it basically teaches you how to attack, and that's about it. It doesn't teach you a lot of the core systems. It doesn't really tell you why you should really care about your mag stats too much. Um, it, it doesn't tell you things about like if, you know your material plans for your characters or anything. There is a massive amount of really important information. The main one is it doesn't tell you anything about your section IDs and why you should care about them. And if, as you know, if you've played PSO quite a bit, your section ID is probably one of the most important things in the game because it completely influences your rare drop table. Yeah, so, so like different enemies will drop different things depending on yeah, what yeah. You, the ID you're assigned, basically. That's it, yeah. And the game just does not tell you at, at all. Mm-hmm. So for someone who knew who's coming in, they're going to have no idea about that and they may end up with a character that's got a, technically a completely unsuitable ID that's just not going to mm-hmm. find anything useful for them. 
Mm. So I think that's one of the main sticking points for PSO for people who are maybe coming it up for the, for the first time. Mm. I, I feel like modern games do a lot better with tutorializing everything and, and making things more accessible. Do you guys think that it's just the reward loop is kind of, well, kind of going back. I think I feel like I'm going back a couple topics here, but like the reward loop of modern games is just so much shorter generally. Um, and maybe a similar way you can think about like how short form video with like TikTok and things like that provides a shorter reward loop for video content as well. Yeah. Um, and it's just like a generational difference in how games reward players almost. Possibly. I, yeah. I definitely think so. Yeah. Sorry to okay. cut you up, Sky. I didn't mean to speak over you there. Um, I, I personally think so. I think um, the more content is being consumed short form, the more that I start to appreciate longer form content as an individual. Mm-hmm. So I feel like not necessarily as a generation, and I want to say this in the least offensive way possible, but I feel like as a collective, we're losing brain cells. I feel like the way that short form content is coming out and, and taken over the world, I feel like people start to lose the appreciation for anything, really anything that's above five minutes, 10 minutes on YouTube, for example. And that's, that's just talking about videos. If you're playing a game, if you were to say to someone that like Sky, I know that's a, that's a really, really long example, but if you were to hunt that weapon for the next four years of your life, if you said that to someone, they'd probably be like, that's yeah, probably not for me, to be fair. <laughs> it's probably, <laughs> you know. Why do you hunt the Seal Jade Sword, Sky? I hunt it because I'm addicted to hunting red boxes, but mainly because <laughs> it's just, I see it as like an, like a, an ultimate sort of end game goal. I think by the mm. time you get to that point, your your gear is pretty much all really, really good. It would see it yeah. again, game, no problem. I think once you get that far in the game, you essentially look at the drop charts, pick something ridiculously rare and go, right, I'm going after that. And that gives you that reason to keep logging in. It's just for, for the slight, slight chance that it might drop. When you think about a lot of games, MMOs and things like that now, I think there's always the turn end game. Just basically yeah. you're on the latest content um, and that is going to be the most challenging content that's and some people say the game doesn't start till end game right um and you know whether that's a good or a bad thing is kind of another thing but you know it'll be like it gets good after 200 something hours something like that um someone's played final fantasy 14 quite clearly <laughs> yeah. well i think a lot like destiny um final fantasy 11 people would say i think every time the game dynamic changes at the top level yeah I agree. um and you know then the question is is like where do you focus that effort and i think most games today have said hey the end game is really important let's let you pay money to skip to end game and then mm-hmm. just let you do that right um PSO was kind of, I think, in some ways, probably made before the idea of like an end game was probably at least popular popularized, I guess. Um, so what do you view as kind of the lifespan of how that game progresses? Like what drives the long term legs of PSO? And are there cl- very clear, distinct um, phases of playing PSO? Um, you know, depending on I imagine level is a big part of this because the core focus of PSO at least initially is get your level up right. So I think that the leveling was definitely my first hook into the game because yeah. aside from obviously the first, I guess your first 10 levels were over in a flash anyway, mm-hmm. but that the dopamine hit you get with the sound effect, with the instant recognition that you've done something good and your brain starts doing the brain things. I feel like after a while, once you start getting into, for example, ultimate now, there's a total switch because you you to, you just completely stop focusing on your level altogether. And that just happens passively because you're having so much fun looking for these weapons that will ultimately never appear. Um, <laughs> it's like a slot machine, but you can never win. You know? it's yeah. Like, um, but yeah, I, I feel like for me, definitely, it, the level, the, the aesthetic of the game and the leveling system sort of draws you in and then it's just a direct shift over it. And it's, it happens so passively because you just... You know, uh, logging on with your friends, chatting through Discord, you're hunting things. Oh, I've I've hit level eighty nine. I've hit level ninety. You know, and, and yeah, that cycle for me, I think, is what really, really keeps the game going. Yeah, I think on, on my end, it, it is very, very similar. I think when you first start PSO, your, your first 
sort of main goal is try and get through the different difficulties and get to ultimate. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I kind of feel like PSO, it almost feels like normal, hard and very hard are an afterthought oh, and are just something that is in the way. I think once yeah. you get to ultimate, for me, that is kind of where PSO starts, honestly. Because yeah. you spend I, mean, I guess so to clarify for there. people, like when you play PSO, the original PSO, same four areas over and yeah, over yeah. again. And it just gets harder and harder each time, basically. And it has like four level ranges, basically. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think once you get to ultimate then, for me, that was the the main focus of the game then. And I agree with what um, Deployable said, that once you get to ultimate, your, your focus does kind of just shift away from leveling just to, right, what can I go and hunt for now? What can I try and find? And mm-hmm. also because of the section ID system, if you're playing with friends, you can look at each other's IDs and think, right, you can get that item here. I can get this item here. So we yeah. can play yeah. together to find that. And it, it's sort of it's, it's a good way of encouraging people to play multiplayer as well. Mm. I think you. Know, I don't think you guys are necessarily saying that. Like once you get into ultimate level, doesn't matter, right? I think to some extent it probably does, um, especially when you yeah, start getting yeah. into some of the later stuff. What would you say is the challenging content once you get into endgame? What are you getting this gear for, and what does it help you do? Yeah, I, I would say that the the. the ch- the challenging content is Control Tower, at least in Episode 1 and 2 and Blue Burst anywhere. Um, because yeah. in Ultimate, basically everything instant kills you more or less. It's mm. incredibly unfair. It, it's just, it's honestly really bad design in some places because you've it's got some It's kind of a hidden spawns. area, right? Like you have to go through yeah, like yeah. a weird way to get to it. It's like you play, is it you play a quest and there's like a side path you go down and it just takes you to it. Is that how it works or... Yeah, so that's one of the ways you can do it. There is other quests that just start you in the tower as well, but initially okay. the way you get to it is by going through another area. Um, but yeah, it's essentially an area where the worst of all the enemies are just concentrated in this one area, and it's just incredibly unfair, and mm. yeah, everything instant kills you. So just just getting strong enough to be able to survive there is is something. But to be honest, even some of the other areas, like when you get to Ultimate, even some of the areas like Ruins can be really, really rough, and you'll yeah. need that good gear to be able to hold your own there as well mm. yeah I, I think that's um obviously from what sky's just said there, i think a lot of it is definitely clearing some of the more difficult missions and areas in pso but i think there's a lot of i guess it, i'll use this term because it, it's a very final fantasy 14 term but i guess fashion for an example is is quite a big thing having the the look of owning yeah. a certain weapon the accolade of having that weapon mm. it's almost like I guess in, in the absence of uh, titles or mounts, for example, I guess that's probably the closest you're going to get to clothing, really. There's not yeah, 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 options. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's probably what, yeah, what I would take. If I got a really cool new weapon, the first thing I would do is probably post in the Discord chat, oh, I've just found this and it's got this and this much hit and, you know, um, and then everyone's like, oh, this is so, so sick. And then do you, you get it, it from? just put it in the bank? Because <laughs> 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 I'd get weapons in PSO like, this looks really cool. I can't use this. And like, yeah. just shove it in the bank kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> so. completely. Yeah, agree. Um, so one thing we haven't talked too much about is that there are like different episodes in PSO. So there's episode one, which is kind of the core four areas. Then there's episode two, which I think was introduced the GameCube version. Is that accurate? It was, um, although yeah. there's like some bleed over with that like version two on Dreamcast, but they're kind of weird like battle arena areas instead. Um, and then there's episode four, and if you don't know, there is a another video game in between called episode three that basically is a different video game, mm. um, which is a very cool game. I like episode three a lot. Uh, but episode four, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't played episode four, but I believe it's just is it how how many levels is in that in four. Uh, it's kind of weird so that there's a crater area but the crater is kind of split into multiple parts and okay. there's a crater interior as well which is the same enemies but in another area and then mm. there's a, a subterranean desert as well which has d- different enemies so it, it is a lot smaller than episode one and two yeah and all these areas were made probably about like two to three years apart from each other game development wise probably or maybe not so much episode two episode four was definitely a ways after the game had come yeah. out though um what is kind of the divide between this content does it all feel pretty consistent to you guys or do you feel like there's very clear um um reasons to run certain areas over others whether it be from drops or challenge level or or anything like that i I would say at least episode two aesthetically is probably the most appealing to me personally visually everything about episode two looks really nice i'd I'd agree with that i think um 
at least for the time that I've spent playing recently, for for a decent amount of time, the go to seems to be you either you're either not geared enough or strong enough to do episode four content yet. I.e. Mm-hmm. for I don't know if you if it's an experience week on Affinia, which is on rotation. Typically, episode four will grant you or reward you with the highest yield of experience. Hold up there. It's on Go rotation. Ahead. I don't know what that means in the case of PSO. So. so would you say this is right? So there's, there's, I think it rotates over four weeks. You've got rare yes, drop. Yeah. yeah, rare drops, uh, rare monsters, XP week. And I can't remember what the last one is. Uh, it's drop all rare. Okay, so drop it's kind of right. like incentives to do certain types of content for everybody yes. at one time. Yeah, okay. yeah. And is this and a uh, Bluebirds thing or is this a Affinia specific thing? I think it's an Affinia thing, isn't it? It is, yeah. So it, it wasn't on the official servers. So it's a community driven thing. Okay. I think yeah. that's smart. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I, I yeah, was just no, like no, rotations. No, cool. Wait a second. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I think um I think that obviously there is a drastic difficulty difference between episode one and four. Um the largest part of that is depending on what class you're playing as well. So it's not just yes, it scales and difficulty, the enemies hit harder, but a lot of it is depending on which class you're playing, it can become quite a nuisance to that class. Um However, I would say that each episode it does have their own kind of landmine missions as well. Like Sky's just mentioned, obviously, Tower as well, which is, I've only done it twice. It's horrific. It scarred me for life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I definitely feel like there are there's different wants and needs from each one. I feel like if you want a more passive, consistent, easygoing experience, then episode one through to Ruins is probably what you would do. Definitely, um, yeah. I feel like episode one is definitely the easiest of the three by far. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's the one that when you, particularly when you get into, into Ultimate, it's the one that you're probably going to focus on initially because you probably won't be able to do Episode 2 Episode 4 just because of the difficulty difference. Yeah. Um, episode 4, I feel like is, it's definitely harder than Episode 1, but it, it feels like a very fair episode. A lot of the enemies feel like they're just, they're designed to be very manageable the more you level up. Mm-hmm. episode two just feels like they had a bad day at the office and decided to be really really unfair with everything and just took <laughs> all of the instant kill in episode two yeah so I, I feel episode two is definitely the most challenging of the three i feel it's it kind of stinks to some extent because i remember when i played it was like a lot of people wanted to avoid episode two there's like no just play episode one and you know there's this kind of iconic quest called towards the future on ep- like pso episode yeah. one and it is like the most mind numbing quest ever, right? Because it's not that interesting. It's basically a boss rush, and people would just do it nonstop over and over and over again. And I think, I think TTF is maybe the start of me being like, I hate optimization in games um, because I have really grown to dislike the optimal way to do things in games. I get really flustered by them, especially when people are like, "You have to do it this way." I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so but i mean it sounds like what you guys were saying earlier with like ttf is like the point of getting is the point of the game kind of end game is ultimate mode so running ttf to get to ultimate might be in some people's way yeah. the way you speed run to get to what you actually want to play versus yeah, the part oh, of the definitely. game where, where you're just i, I think realistically unless weapons, you're hunting yeah. like red ring or unless you're traveling towards ultimate between those brackets, if you're not doing it for, say, for example, if you're over level 80 and you're not hunting anything, yeah. doing TTF is such a mindless experience. Like like you yeah. just said, it is so mind-numbing. And realistically, with PSO, like you, you touched on endgame earlier, that the word the terminology, endgame, the, the endgame of PSO is the whole game. It, the, the whole game is, <laughs> is the journey, you know? Um, the whole game is the journey. I, mean, I need to think about that. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, the, the thing is for me. I think, like you've just said, we focus so much on oh, I need to get to end game. End game where it gets good, or you know, in Final Fantasy fourteen, you have to play all the story to be able to unlock everything, and so on and so forth. Whereas with PSO, whatever's relevant to you at that time is what you're hunting for and searching for. So your levels will happen passively. You can feed your mag every three and a half minutes. I think it is. So you'll just do that passively. So realistically, if you're out to hunt something for a certain period of time or or look for something that could be from i don't know a drop from very hard which you can do fairly early on or if it is from early ultimate your end game quote unquote starts there you know the, the end game is is the whole game in my opinion i would maybe argue that uh, when i play pso personally mm. having a my life 
going however it is and i'm just like this is what i'm gonna do right now i don't know what i'm doing with my life i'm just gonna play some pso <laughs> um very rarely do i get past hard i will okay. start hard and i will not get past hard um so to me there's an appeal there before hunting rares i think the way that affinia is set out even without experience week you could pretty much blast through to very hard really quickly if you wanted yeah. to I would argue that you could probably do it in, if it depends how dedicated you are, I could do it in two sittings, I would say. Yeah. Quite consistently. If you just ran, if all you did was run TTF, you could just do it quite quickly. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I guess, honestly, yeah, I, I guess, play on console most of the time is where I play a lot of times. Yeah. If, if you're having dumb, a more linear I experience, am. I can yeah. understand that. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if it's just you switching off, playing some games in your own time, at your own pace, then I can understand that, yeah, PSO probably, in terms of drops anyway, yeah. doesn't really get going to at least very hard yeah. for some drops. When I think about endgame and modern games, I think of the content train. Um, mm-hmm. Something about Final Fantasy XIV, I think it's a good comparison point. Probably a lot of people have played Final Fantasy XIV, but a lot of, I think, modern MMOs in general, um, they release content. Here's this armor for this time frame. And then once this time frame's over, this gear is useless. Throw it out. You got yeah. a new set of gear going on, putting it on at this moment. Um, part of that is, I think, because, and I think this is true for content as well, where some pieces of content just straight up don't matter anymore and nobody will do it because it's just not the thing people are doing right now, right? Um, and a lot of that comes from the ability to update a game and continually be able to inject new content over and over and over again. Um, where PSO, you know, being on a console that doesn't have a hard drive, you know, memory cards have very limited space. Um, it has static content. Um, what do you think is probably like the biggest difference between playing an end game in an MMO that has evolving content versus one that has static content, the different appeals maybe? I think for me, it's quite an interesting comparison because you can compare this in Fantasy Star. So mm-hmm. in PSO, you've obviously got that, what you mentioned, where what you got in the game was what you got. There was no updates. Um, Technically, there were downloadable quests. Maybe I should put that yeah. out there, but they were kind of not big content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Compare that to the current game, NGS, which is obviously live service. Mm-hmm. So NGS functions very similar to what you mentioned, where you'll find a set of gear, and then a co- maybe a month later, some other mm-hmm. gear will get added, which will make that previous one redundant. So I think there's advantages and disadvantages to both, because... With something like NGS, you can log on, you can run whatever the current latest thing is, get the newest gear. You'll probably be able to get it reasonably easily because everyone's running the new content, and then Mm -hmm. you can move on and upgrade when you want to. I think the advantage of doing it the way PSO did, though, is you've got a long-term defined goal. So if you find something you want to do, whether it's a rare drop or whether you want to get a character to level 200 or something, Mm -hmm. you can think, right, I want to do this goal. I've got all the time in the world to do it. Um, so it's it's very different for, for both games, really. And I think that what what caters to one person might not cater to someone else. And that, that also could be a reason why people struggle to go between NGS and PSO as well, because they're so different in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. I think I, in terms of MMOs, because I've not got to perhaps where you are, Sky, on, on, on the NGS front, I guess having experience in, in some other MMOs, not all to the extent of end game, if we're using that term. I do really appreciate the static table of these are the weapons in the game. These are the armor sets in the game. This is what you can, depending on what you grind or depending on what you kill and how lucky you get, this is what, what you can get and this will always remain this powerful over this amount of time period. Mm-hmm. Um, because I really do feel like there is the accolade there of you've you've got this now like that there is nothing better than that other than percentages of that weapon but there is nothing better than that in the game um, for what you you want and i get that is subjective in itself but you do run the risk of then once you have that where do you go from there you know yeah. uh what's what's the next so it's it's trying to find a halfway house so i guess i'm 50 50 on both mm-hmm. i do love the way that pso is i love the fact that you can, like Sky said earlier, you can just 
okay, we're logging on tonight. Let's hunt something and hope we get it. If we don't, we still have a good time anyway. But I also do appreciate that things do get stale. So I guess it's trying to find the, a happy medium for everything and doing it the right way without making people feel like, well, I've just spent the last 20, 30 hours grinding for a set of gear that I've now got, and now you're going to update my game and tell me that it's redundant. So it's it's kind of hard. Do you think there's a game that does that balance well? Mm, not that not that I've yet experienced anyway. But I I, I again I've not got to end game in in many games. Truthfully, I yeah. kind of take a bit of a scattergun approach these days. Yeah, I think the only game I can think of that maybe does it reasonably well is something like one of the more recent Monster Hunter games. I know it's not an MMO or anything, but you've got the the as defined... much as PSO one is an MMO, so you know <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think in games like Monster Hunter World, for example, you've got the you know the, de- the dedicated items in the game that are there at launch that you you know you can always go for. Mm. But then because of it being a more recent game, you've got that add-on content as well that gets added over time. So even though you've got all this stuff in the background you can hunt, you can also then pivot to anything new that gets added. Now, there is a little downside to that in that sometimes you will get it where some of the new content will uh, overshadow the previous stuff. So there is kind of a fine line between how to balance it. I feel like Monster Hunter is probably one of the better games for doing it overall, though. Is there anything that you think um, more modern MMOs would benefit taking from a game like PSO in general? Hmm. If if there's anything more direct you can point out. I know a lot of games are built on what PSO did to some extent, right? But Yeah, I guess that was probably going to be my point because I guess, depending on which way you look at it, PSO laid a foundation for a lot of these games. Um, I I guess the social aspect, which we've already spoke about with PSO, is something that I would love to see become more prominent in some newer games. Yeah, and I think... We, we spoke about it earlier, but I think one of the reasons why you have such little issue with public chat in PSO and you don't really get too many people that are, are trying to be toxic to each other is because there's two factors here. If, if you're playing on controller, you've got to put that controller down to even mm-hmm. type in the first place. You've really got to have some grudges to have to stop what you're doing to type something out. And then you've also got a limited amount of characters as well. Yeah. And there's nothing more embarrassing than typing something out, hitting enter, and then realizing, oh, I've left like half my message behind. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I'd love to see some sort of, um, some sort of social take from PSO in a lot of games, and I'm sure there are. I'm sure I'm probably blind to it, but I just felt like that they've done such a a great. I don't like the word community. Always, you know, sometimes it, it can be too overarching, but mm. I'd love to see a, a greater sense of, I guess, the the, the social aspect of building a community and banding everyone together rather than just you know here, here's a here's a map here's ten thousand people try and go about your experiences but you'll end up doing it individually instead you know yeah it's it's an interesting one really i think because of what you mentioned obviously pso did directly influence a lot of later games i know for example that the the monster Hunter team have, have cited pso as an influence in the past um <laughs> which is really weird because then the PSO2 team and um, they then cited Monster Hunter team as a influence. So yeah. I don't know how that works, but um, it, it's really, really interesting. I think the social one is definitely a big thing with PSO. It was a, a massive part of the game back when it was on the official servers and even mm-hmm. to an extent now as well. Um, I feel there are not many games that do that particularly well now. A lot of games are very focused on the actual grind loop of the game and the, the game's main content, I guess. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel that PSO it was pretty revolutionary for the time it was although it was a fully featured game i always used to joke that pso was essentially a chat room with a game added to it yeah because it was such a a fully functional social experience um even just things that it did back in the day like the the word select so you could auto translate messages to other languages so you could communicate mm-hmm. with people around the world i feel that a lot of that revolutionary side that pso did i feel modern games haven't quite touched on as much um, it is difficult though because of the the influence that PSO has on modern games, so a lot of it has carried over anywhere. Yeah, uh, it's interesting you bring up the translation thing. Um, something I super appreciate about Final Fantasy XI and the original Final Fantasy XIV is that those were global servers that you know 
in a lot of ways w- it was a problem because of how slow it made those games feel. Um, but it did mean that when you logged on to play, you were exposed to people from around the world, different languages and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. And, um, and to some extent you would see those things, not even though everyone's on the same server, you know, people would artificially kind of separate themselves. Right. And, you know, it's just kind of natural to some extent, but, um, but I do feel like when I when I think about modern MMOs, I think about it from a region perspective. There's regional servers. You join your data center for your region. And I believe those are based on like who you actually play with as well, all that stuff. And I think part of that, to me, it's kind of interesting that that part of gaming has in some ways felt like it's gone away. Um, do you view that as like an appealing part of those old games or do you think that was just kind of there just because we need to keep our server costs down so one server makes sense? Is that something you appreciate it at all, I guess? Yeah, I think for me, it, it, it's a really interesting one with PSO because PSO obviously had the global servers initially, but for, mm-hmm. for Bluebest, they moved away from it. So for mm-hmm. Bluebest, they moved to regional servers. So the Japanese version of Bluebest was totally separate from the uh, Western version. So I feel like that was the the time it was starting to shift. I, I do miss having global servers um, because it it I just think it's a fantastic thing to expose people to to other you know to other languages to people all around the world. It can only be a good thing, really. And I feel that having regional servers primarily in games now has taken away some of that, and it, it's a shame, really. I find. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd echo that as well. I think actually, funny enough, one of my fondest experiences when, when i used to play the uh the jp server of uh of pso2 there was just i don't know whether it was not fully understanding the context of everything that was going on around you but i think meeting so many different people from all different walks of life albeit most of them were probably my next door neighbors doing exactly the same thing anyway but <laughs> i think you just it's a different experience and i think as much as i get the global servers they they're not the um they're not the meta, are they? They're not the most efficient way to do things, but there's definitely something to be said about what they brought to the table and what they did for the social experience of any game, really. So, you know, we talked about Infinia having some, it sounds like some more modern kind of live service game aspect where we're going to have this time frame where we're going to encourage you to do something. Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways you can look at that from the fear of missing out, or you can also look at it as a way to congregate people around the same content and stuff like that as well. Um, and I think there's like either two ways you can answer this or you can answer it both ways is, um, you know, what do you feel like Infinia, uh, Infinia is that what it's, um, does well that like from a modification standpoint to make PSO feel more modern? Um, and then also, what do you think a game like PSO would benefit from if there was ever like someone who modified some more modern feature into PSO today? Like, what do you think would be the biggest benefit? So for me, one of the one of the big things is just quality of life changes that that would have been in the game. I think if the game had released twenty years later, that the, it would have been in. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that Affinia does is it does give you a lot of features that the the later games actually didn't reduce. So it reduces things like um, when a rare drops, it will drop for a specific person. It won't appear to everyone else. Everyone's got their own instance drops. Mm-hmm. Whereas anyone who played PSO online back in the day knows that when a red box dropped, everyone just ran as fast as they could towards it because <laughs> you, it just gets swiped from you otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is definitely a big improvement. Um, yeah. Just other little things as well, just like um, giving you access to things like a shared bank as well, which is, again, things that are now commonplace in a lot of games now. Um, just to streamline the experience a bit, really. Just just basically to give PSO features that it probably would have had if it had released later on. Mm-hmm. Was the was the hot bar on Blue Burst originally, or was that an affinity thing? Um, that was originally on Blue Burst, yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. that's quite. So you handy can use like way. one through zero, I think. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, yeah. Anything else deployable you want to add to that, or that was pretty much? No, no. I mean, I think. Um, I think I guess from my experience of obviously if I've played version one, version two of the Dreamcast, literally anything that's been done better at this point will be a bonus. <laughs> um, but uh, I must admit, from from the time that I spent playing on Affinia, the um, I guess part of it could be just 
running alongside the, the newer PCs and the the um, the hardware and stuff that we've got now obviously helps a lot. You know, um, you've got options to sort of reduce loading times, you cut any of the uh, title screen videos out that you can get straight into the experience. You've got so many different backup servers and different lobbies. And yeah, I, I guess... I guess anything that's you're not reinventing the wheel here right? in in many ways. I guess a lot of things that PSO modern day PSO uses now is is probably in in majority of titles anyway. Without trying to rack my brain for anything else that could potentially be taken forward into into other games or at least taken inspiration from what PSO is doing. Is there anything bad in PSO that you never want changed? Anything bad in PSO that I never want to change? Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear! Let me the red see. Drops. <laughs> yeah, the drop rate. The, yeah. Ridiculous drop rate. Oh I god! Mean, yeah. Where, what were the game be if you didn't have to just play it forever, hoping something fell? Exactly. So. I tell you what. Actually, one thing that I would never change, which is really, really funny to witness, is someone hitting a photo on blast at the wrong time. <laughs> I absolutely adore the fact that you can press one button and pause the lobby for five seconds. I love the fact that it doesn't matter what you're doing. Like you could just press a button. You're like, well, you're forced to watch a cutscene. <laughs> now. There's nothing you can do about it. When you get your photon blast, it also restricts you from using half your controls, yeah. basically. And it's yeah, just like, it does, great. Yeah. I don't have access yeah. to any of these right now unless I go through the shortcut window or whatever. So, so yeah. Okay. And then, um, oh, sorry. Uh, was drop rate your answer, Sky, or did you have anything else to add for that? Uh, I think drop rates would be the main one. I think that obviously the drop rates for some of the end game stuff is going to put a lot of people off but for me i i I just see it as a challenge (laughs) so probably says a lot about me to be honest if you guys you know i've mentioned this theoretical person earlier 20 year old fresh out of college i love minecraft i love fortnite you need to convince them to play pso (laughs) what would you tell them as your best attempt to convince them that PSO is a game that they may enjoy? Obviously there's always the answer of you don't have to enjoy PSO, but let's assume they are a, a soft bit of clay that your words will mold their experience to get them to enjoy it the best they could. I would say that on the basis that for the last three years, you've been, entering battle royales relentlessly in order to come close to the top 10 and you failed every single time (laughs) why not join a game that will allow you to grind for the next four years and still not get what you want you (laughs) clearly clearly like the idea of just doing something and getting nothing from it welcome in take a seat any way you want any way you want no in all seriousness i think um i think that's a very 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 tough sell very especially if we're talking tough questions baby you do you do (laughs) yeah you're not not here for a good time that's for sure um yeah i I don't know if i could honestly because it is i think i don't like to use the word zoomer and all this gen x or whatever it is these days but i think for, for younger people i just don't feel like the concentration or the patience with these games would be there and that could i could be and i'd love to be proved wrong i really would and I feel like, not to go off tangent, I feel like we, I say that a lot, but I think our patience for these games has developed through the lack of hardware support on these titles, i.e. dial-up connection, uh, really poor broadband. You know, we've, we, we're used to waiting to get into these games and lobbies, so I think we've had to be more patient and resilient over time, whereas now everything is just like Amazon Prime here the next day, you know, like instant collection. Like it's, I guess they're not really designed for it i'd be happy to be proved wrong though i know that's not an answer to your question but that's my thoughts either way yeah i think for me i agree it, it is a very very hard sell to convince someone to try pso if they've never tried it before just because honestly as someone going it for the first time it's going to feel incredibly old-fashioned and incredibly janky but what i would say is to anyone who's trying it just try and look past that and look at how revolutionary the game was just try and look look back at the gaming industry in sort of early 2000s and see what pso was doing at the time and then look at all of your modern games and see how much of that has come from pso and maybe give it a try just to see where it all came from mm-hmm. and then get lost in the rare drops and never stop playing again <laughs> <laughs> 
I think um, something I've really tried to do with Final Fantasy XI is um, take a step back and think about what is the base human appeal of this game to me? Um, because I think it is easy for me to sit there and be like, okay, you know, social media wasn't around. Um, you know, this is a very specific game that came out at a very specific point in time. Um, and that's fine and everything, but I do think there is, um, I think it's important when we're looking at these games to understand that like there is like a connection to there's a reason we got into it in the first place. And I don't necessarily think it was always because there just weren't other options. Right. Um, you know, I think I talked a little bit about the idea in the video I made about like, you know, PSO in some ways feels like a bar. Right. And I think the need for that kind of interaction never really goes away. Right. Um, and, but it, you know, where you're getting that interaction is different for each person. Yeah. Um, some places, a physical bar, some places that's PSO, some places that is like, you know, um, you know, a modern game and things like that. And, um, one of the things I was really taken aback by playing Final Fantasy 11 on the rollback servers with horizon 11 is there are a number of people who play that who are younger and have never played Final Fantasy XI before. And they're here and playing this game. Um, and I think Final Fantasy XI has the benefit of Final Fantasy XIV being so huge, where like the new Genesis feels kind of like it's there. I don't really get the impression it's doing anything crazy, but I think it's profitable. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be gone, right? Um, and um, I don't really know if you guys have any thoughts on like where that's going, although maybe it doesn't really matter for this particular case. But it, it makes me sit down and think about like where where people. Why people are enjoying Final Fantasy 11, and I, I know curiosity is definitely a part of it, but I definitely have seen people say, you know, the type of game Final Fantasy 11 is and what it offers is also incredibly different in what Final Fantasy 14 offers. And I wonder if PSO to some extent can be that as well. Um, I know it is like a very janky action game when you think about it. It's a very simple action game. It has a very simple flow to it. Um, but I do think there's a lot to be said about like the readability and the dynamic nature of the combat and all that stuff. So um, I don't know if that changes your guys' thoughts on that at all, but I think that is kind of where I am at mindset wise when I look at these games a lot of times where it's like, what is that the kind of baseline human appeal that kind of like the history of PSO I think is important, but I don't necessarily know if it is like the sole reason. I think that's probably get into like the nostalgia aspect of me not really liking like the nostalgia excuse for games a lot of times, because while I think it's important that like nostalgia is important and it describes a overarching thing about a game. I don't know if it describes the, pieces that make that nostalgia almost right the the pieces that make that up so uh, i don't know if that helps with like maybe kind of the direction i'm thinking in terms of the response for like an answer like that if you have any other for the and another answer is also i don't know how to communicate that that's perfectly fine as well or you don't believe it as well but i think in my head that's where i'm at mentally with final fantasy 11 at the very least so i don't know if you guys have any thoughts about yeah, does like game I think, like PSO um, it allows for that I think it, it, from your your point there about Final Fantasy XI, I think mm -hmm. does make perfect sense, and I completely agree. I feel like an easier sell in that case mm -hmm. would be to potentially sell the ideology of NGS. If someone's never dealt or never played with Fantasy Star, then I feel like the ideology of selling NGS to them first to then potentially port them into PSO Blue Burst would probably be an easier sell than directly shipping them straight to Blue Burst itself. And what you've just said there about the trajectory of Final Fantasy XIV, yeah, I'm sure eleven has got a player base on its own merit. But yeah, yeah you know, you've got the accolade of, of 14 being one of the biggest MMOs in in its space. Absolutely. Whereas yeah. I feel like if Fantasy Star NGS did that, then I can imagine you would probably see quite a few, maybe not hundreds of thousands but you definitely see more people even if it's just out of curiosity just to oh what's this little game doing on the internet and then uh that could potentially be an easier sell but i still do think trying to sell a, a, a raw experience of pso blue burst to someone that's never experienced fantasy star online 
at the age of 20, for example, would be just <laughs> nigh on impossible. Yeah. Um, how about a new Genesis player then? Someone who's only played new Genesis. How do you, how do you connect it back to them? Do you think? Think of everything that you hate about that game. We've got the, the answer over here. <laughs> come, come and take this. Have, have this. Have this. Do you, do you find you, are you moving too quickly? Come on over here. Come on. You, you just, so you, just to clarify, you don't like jumping. Come here. Follow me. Far easier. No, in, in, in all seriousness, I, th- I feel like if someone's enjoying the experience of, of NGS, but they're looking for something perhaps, and I don't want to discredit NGS, but looking for something a bit more below the surface level, you know, below the, like Sky said, it is a very casual experience if you want it to be. I'm sure there are some end game components to it. Oh, but I feel is, like yeah. if you want something that you can really scrape away at and get your teeth into and have an objective, whether it is passively um, or, you're so, sorry, whether it's directly or indirectly to sort of chip away at, I feel like PSO would be a, a great selling point for someone in NGS where perhaps they've done all the content and they are just logging in for daily tasks and they want that extra grind. Maybe they've got the season's best gear at that time and they can't do any more. You know, I feel like PSO, is, as much as it's frustrating to not get your drop, it does constantly keep you on that railroad of this is what I'm trying to achieve and you never get there quicker than you should if that makes sense yeah I think for the friend Jess players it's probably a, a bit of an easier sell because if they enjoy that game they're probably somewhat invested in Fantasy Star anyway so I think then it's easier to to recommend the older games for them to go and check out even if they're just wanting to see how the series has progressed or if they're just wanting to, to try something a bit different to, to NGS I, I feel Definitely for NGS players, it is definitely a much easier sell, but it is still very, very difficult just because of how, I guess, how niche PSO is now 20 years later. It, mm. it, it is still a very difficult game to recommend. And I think another reason it's difficult to recommend is just because of how difficult it is to actually play now. Yes, you've got the private servers available, mm. but outside of that, if you're wanting to play the actual Sega version of the game, You've only got access to you know, old retro consoles, or you know, there's not many other ways of, of being able to play it reliably. Mm. And I feel that a lot of people, even if they did that, wouldn't necessarily get the same experience that we did when when we played it originally, because a lot of the experience of PSO is the online part. Yeah, I mean that's what the fan servers are for. I know it's yeah. not an exact replication, but you know, yeah, yeah. I, I think when you think about PSO in the modern sense, I think. Um, uh, when it comes to new Genesis investment, do you mean mechanically or lore wise? Like it's easier to onboard um, because they have an investment in new Genesis specifically. I would say probably more towards the law side, just because there are elements in NGS that do pop up in PSO as well. Mm-hmm. But I suppose there are some things with NGS that do carry between the chip, you know, between NGS and PSO. So, you know, at, with NGS, once you get to whatever the current loop is, you are still essentially looking for rare gear. Mm-hmm. So I think if you are invested in that side of things, then maybe a PSO's loop would appeal to you more. I feel a little bad because I think that little rant at the end was kind of misguided. I think I was presenting it as a way for them to convince somebody to play PSO. But what I really wanted to get at was helping somebody appreciate PSO. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to play it. So I feel like I presented the question a real a weird way that kind of got caught up on like whether or not somebody who is younger would play it or not, right? But if I were to like sum up what, what I heard and what I think I, I really learned was kind of the defining things about what they like about Fantasy Star Online, I think it kind of comes down to uh, the you know, long-term defined goals um, you know, the, the, maybe to some extent, like a delayed satisfaction, right? It is this long process of you trying to achieve this goal as well. And then finally, when you get that goal, there's a very likely possibility that that thing will be relevant to you in the long term. And it's not just going to be something that, you know, a month from now, it's just going to kind of dissipate into the ether because that thing will be replaced by the next big new item kind of thing, right? And some of that's the limitations of what the game released as, but that still is kind of what the game is today you know when you put it alongside a lot of other modern live service games that kind of tickle sim- similar itches i think but i also want to emphasize i think you know i've mentioned a couple times in the show that like oh i don't really like nostalgia and things like that 
and and using nostalgia. But I think at the end of the day, you know, if you just enjoy playing an old game that you really like, that's also fine, right? Like if that is just something you enjoy doing, I think that's really important. So I want to make sure that I'm not like minimizing that as well. So sorry, if you can't tell, little self-conscious about how that podcast ended. But, you know, I think they did a really good job of explaining, you know, how they felt about these games and stuff like that. And, and I really appreciate them coming on. And I really enjoy my time talking to them. And, and I thought that it was a really... Um, eye-opening experience for me not only from a Fancy Star Online perspective but also you know what kind of defines each of these games separately from each other so I'm really glad that they they talked to me and that you also were able to come with me on this journey as well so if you want more Fancy Star Online though well let me tell you I know two guys <laughs> that can do that for you. Section Skylight streams on YouTube and I believe on Twitch as well, where they just kind of do their runs searching for rares. So if you just want to like hang out in a, in a chat and chat, they seem like pretty chill streams from what I've seen. So definitely go check that out and hang out if that is like up your alley. Um, he also, as last I checked, is also still doing lore videos and he's also checking out a bunch of other Fancy Star Online games as well still. Um, I saw he recently did a Fancy Star Zero uh, first impressions thing, which I love Fantasy Star Zero, so we did not touch touch on it during the show today. And Deployable Lover actually uh, has spent a lot of time doing Lord of the Rings videos recently, so if you want to check out Lord of the Rings Online, he's got a lot of videos going up about that. I know nothing about Lord of the Rings Online, so I, I think it would be a really interesting experience to sit down and watch those and, and learn about this, this old MMO that I don't know anything about. Um, I think both of them have discords and uh, patreons and Kofi. So if you go enjoy their stuff, you know, definitely feel free to, to look into joining their communities or or also supporting them. I know that I don't have a lot of influence there on that, but if you enjoy their content, you should you should help them out. You should do that. So anyways, but either way, check them out. <laughs>